Um, hello, everyone. Happy lunchtime. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Martin O'Reilly, um, uh, Director of Research Engineering here at the Turing, and I'm in the Research Engineering Group, and, and we're a team of research software engineers, research data scientists, and research computing engineers, and we work across the Institute's research program to sort of generate reusable software, reproducible uh, analysis, and, and ensure that the Institute's research can be deployed on flexible, scalable compute. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about agile practices for research software development, and um, these, and I'm going to talk about three things. Um, I'm going to talk about what Agile is, why it came about, and, and what, why you should care about it. And I'm going to talk about some Agile practices, sort of the, the things that, that people do and, and, that, and that we've adopted in, in Reg and uh, others at the Turing to, to kind of put those into practice, and some of the tools uh, that we use here at the Turing to, to, to do that. So... Firstly, you know, what is Agile? Well, you know, it's, it's a set of working practices for software development, but these can also be applied more generally to sort of project development or producing other types of work in a, in, in a project. And fundamentally, the problem Agile is trying to solve is one of uncertainty. And there's three main sources of uncertainty when it comes to software. And the first and biggest of these is uncertainty around the problem. What is it that we're trying to tackle? And this is familiar to us all here in the research space. You know, very often we have some idea of the problem we're trying to tackle, but until we actually start the project, uh, you know, we don't exactly know the shape of the problem. And even out in the commercial business world, uh, you know, startups will have very high problem uncertainty. They, they, they'll have an idea, they'll think there's a market for their idea, and they'll sort of find out when they take it to market that maybe, you know, people want something different. Or even for established software, uh, you might have something, some feedback from users, uh, you know, they might be asking for something, it may be their problem, something else. Um, the second source of uncertainty is around the solution. Once you know what the problem is, you still have to figure out how to solve that problem. And if we knew the problem and we knew the solution, we, we wouldn't be doing research. So both of these are really big sources of uncertainty in the research space. And this is why sort of agile techniques are, are sort of really uh, useful in, uh, you know, for us. Uh, and then the final source, even if you have the problem well-defined and you have the solution well-defined, figuring out how to implement that solution uh, is also a, a source of uncertainty. Some ideas might work, some ideas might not, some might not be fast enough, some may sort of not, you know, sort of work with, with the user base or uh, sort of not, you know, allow us to do other things that we want to do. And so the key message I want to give to you here is that you can never remove uncertainty, you know, even if you're, you know, even if in the most certain worlds you've still got this implementation problem and in the research space we are way on the left here we we definitely don't know how to implement it we don't know what the solution is and and, and we often are quite uncertain about the problem so what were people doing before agile and 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 sort of why why was agile sort of developed well the main sort of process for you know pre-agile processes are, are now sort of referred to as waterfall and the idea here is over the course of your project which might be months it might be years you do requirements gathering up front, and then once you know what the requirements are, you design your product or your software, and then once you've designed it, you sort of fix that, and then you develop to the design, and then once you've developed it, you test it to make sure that it actually does the things that the design says it should do, and then you deploy it, and then your project's done, you know, one or two years after you started, three or six months after you've started. And you might recognize those first three as just different ways of those two, those three sources of uncertainty. Uh, you know, the requirements are what's the problem? Do we understand, you know, the, the, the thing we're trying to do and, and, and what a solution needs, needs to address? The design is how are we going to solve that problem? What's the solution? And the development is the implementation. How are we going to go about sort of making that solution concrete in software? And the problem with this approach is, as I said, there's a huge amount of uncertainty in those three blue boxes. And for a project, it, it, it's very tempting and people have historically tried to sort of fix these three aspects, the scope, kind of what is it that we're going to do, uh, the cost, you know, how many people are going, going to we, are we going to have running on it, and the time, you know, sort of when, when will this software be delivered. And as we saw before, we can't get rid of uncertainty even out in the most certain world and certainly not in the software world. And so we can't fix this scope up front. And what that means in practice is if you're doing this kind of big single iteration waterfall model uh, that you sort of get partially through developing your scope and then you realize you need to sort of cut from the things you haven't developed yet or you're going to run over time or you're going to run over budget. 
And so what Agile does is say, well, look, we've got a lot of uncertainty, so why don't we try and reduce that uncertainty? And why don't we try and sort of deliver sort of value early? And what it does is it compresses this development pipeline down into much, much shorter, much, much smaller iterations. And then in that same three to six months or one to two years, you can have many, many iterations of this cycle. And it turns out if you make those small enough, you can actually fix all of those things at once. You can say, we're going to have three people working on this for the next two weeks, and we're only going to try and do these five things. And that's, you know, that that's the secret power of Agile. What it does is it is it sort of compresses things down into what are the next few most important things to do, or what are the things that will help us most learn about what the problem is or what the solution should be. Let's do those. Let's fully develop those so that that value is available to, you know, as part of our, 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 our software, that that can be run and then let's do another iteration to have the next most important things and the next most important things. And as we go, we might sort of change what we're doing and we might sort of re, re, re sort of retarget the software as we learn. But again, each of those cycles can, can do that. So I'm going to cover a few Agile principles. There's a, there's a whole Agile manifesto and there's these 12 principles from the manifesto. And I'm going to give you a kind of slightly you know, distilled, slightly paraphrased version of these uh, that, that I think sort of carry the, the important features of, of the Agile methodology. And, and the first one is this focus on value. You know, at each of these sort of iterations, we're looking at doing the thing that we can learn the most off from, or that provides the most value to the end users. You know, so if it's software for customers, it's the customers. Um, if it's uh, uh, our research we're doing to try and answer a question, it's, it's you know, maybe it's the paper is the out, you know is is one of those outputs. If it's something where we want others to be able to use the methods we've developed, then it's okay. You know, what is the thing that will let let them use you know some some part of these methods? But the the key thing here is this this is sort of vertical rather than horizontal. So if you were doing a logon page, you wouldn't build a database and then build the page that connects to the database and lets people log in. What you would do is you would build a very simple login, maybe with a fixed single user and password that doesn't use a database at all. Then maybe you could support a few users because you want to try out um, different pages only being accessed to admins or super users or things like that. So you might just, you know, hard code a few different users with a few different roles. And then, you know, later you can add the database. And the idea here is that you have some version of the product, you know, some version of the software. It, it doesn't have to be the thing you would deploy but it has to be something where you can see that functionality in action and you can learn from it and you can you can sort of build on top of it and you can bank the value of the work you've done so far. Uh, and the the other sort of key thing is, you know, rather than be afraid of change, you know, yes, we're using Agile to sort of control change and bound, uh, sort of control uncertainty and bound uncertainty, but what that, you know, by binding, you know, by fixing, you know, by making things very fixed inside these small cycles, we then, and by banking the value of those cycles after each cycle, we then free ourselves up to do something completely different next cycle. And, and that is sort of what allows us to uh, react to what we've learned, to do the next most important thing, or if priorities change, we can we can lean into that. And what we don't have is this huge big thing that's not ready until many, many months from the end. And there'll always be a bit at the beginning where maybe something won't quite be ready. But when you've heard about this concept of a minimum viable product that's kind of what people are talking about here it's how do you get to the point where there is some usable version of this this software that you're building uh, as early as possible and then then you build on top of that and that takes me to the next point which is that working software is the primary measure of success here so after every iteration you have some version of the working software with some incremental addition of value that banks the work you've done so far and occasionally you might do what we call a spike. You might go and do a bit of a research thing. Um, uh, uh, it, when we're starting projects that are where we're very uncertain about the question in Reg, we often do uh, something we call a back brief, which is a week or two where we go and sort of talk to people and we do an extended scoping exercise and we under look to understand the data and really what the problem is. And it's okay for, you know, and, and that might result in a, you know, a sort of, you know, a summary paper. It might not result in some software, or you might build some software to try out a, 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 an approach you're thinking about doing, or a technology you're thinking about using, and then you might sort of throw it away and, and and sort of do it properly. But you know, you can do a few of those. You can do them deliberately. But what you've banked there is the learning. And then the key thing here is work small. So so you you, you shrink that down so that you're you know, and you limit work in progress, so that you can be very confident about what you can deliver. And if you're a team of five people, it's very tempting to do, you know, two or three things each and end up working on 10 or 15 things. But again, 
make it a week or two, make it, make it more like half the number of things than you have people. So if you're five people, work on two things at a time. You know, if they're small enough, you can do a few of them in a fortnight. Some organizations go go the other extreme and they make their cycles a few days or they go more continuous and they do it for each piece of work. But the idea is to make it small so that you can make it certain so you can deliver it as working software quickly and then move on to the next thing. And that's another sort of key aspect is that you're delivering often. And this is one of the things often there's this whole tension between, can you tell me how long it's going to take? Can you tell me when this functionality is going to be de delivered? And the key thing here, both for our own confidence and for those uh, who are maybe a little further away from the software development process, um, you, you know, as you deliver working software that delivers incremental value time and time again, every week, every fortnight, then there are many, many opportunities to decide and change and evolve your opinion on what the most important thing is. There are very many opportunities to realize that something's more difficult than you thought it is, and it's going to take a bit more time and decide if it's worth putting more effort in. And um, and you are sort of gaining that confidence yourself and, and, and with your collaborators that, you know, this thing is going to be working software and it's going to deliver value. And this sort of leads me, I think, to the, to the next critical point, which is, a key, a key thing that makes Agile work is really close collaboration between everybody who know, who has all the skills and all the knowledge needed to make this work. And that, so that's the uh, people who are going to be using the software. It's the people who, uh, you know, have the research problem. It's the people who have the domain expertise. It's all the different types of um, technical expertise you might need to write the software. It's the project management expertise. It's the uh, expertise at user experience, you know, sort of how, how people interact with that software, but also kind of, you know, connecting into to user needs and the idea is that all of these people are communicating all of the time and in the you know formal agile principles they talk a huge amount about you know face-to-face -face and conversate and synchronous conversations and um those are extremely valuable but you know thinking about us in a, a sort of remote first agile world at the turing there are ways to you know recreate and maintain that kind of really close collaboration uh, uh remotely and, and asynchronously and with that team, you sort of put that team together and you put all of the people needed to kind of figure out what the right thing to do is, what to prioritize and and, and sort of how to deliver into that team. And then you trust the team to, to figure out how to deliver that. And, and this is often talked about like empowering the team and it's talked about self-organizing teams. And I'll talk, you know, about some of the practices later and I'll talk about some of the tools. But the, you know, a key thing here is, especially in the research context where, different collaborators may have different experience of working in different ways. You know, the team working together on something needs to figure out the sort of the best set of things from, from the kind of agile playbook that will work for them and the best kind of working practices that will work for them. And as long as they're delivering incremental value regularly as working software, then everything will be fine. And then, you know, another sort of key and fi final aspect of this is that as well as those sort of software cycles, uh, you you sort of reflect and learn at the end of every cycle. You've got some working software. You you put it in front of the people who are going to be using it or who know what it needs to do. You validate whether that is actually the solution to the problem that they had, whether in fact you're solving the right problem. Um, and you also sort of do that meta level of reflection. What is it about how we're working that's worked well? What is it about how we're working that's been a bit challenging? How you know how can we change that? Are there different things we can do? And the final point is that we do all of this sustainably. So in you know, big software projects, on the, especially under the waterfall model, there's this sort of huge tendency to have these massive crunch periods at the end where you're trying to pile more effort in on the project and everybody's working really long hours because it turns out that you, know, you, were tr you, know, you couldn't accurately estimate six months ago, two years ago, you know, everything you needed to do and how long it would take. And you've left it, you know, you've left all of the sort of things needed to realize value from that, the you know, sort of putting it all together, testing it, getting in front of users until the end. And so by doing this little and often, uh, you know, we're constantly delivering that value. We're constantly having a better working version of the of the software and, you know, we're working sustainably. And now in the research context, there'll you know, always be those, you know, conference deadlines or, or paper deadlines where, a little bit of extra effort will go a long way, but you know, a key principle is is that this should be a pace that you could do day in, day out, week in, week out, year in, year out. So 
now I'm going to talk a, a little bit about some of the, the practices that I guess realize those principles in reality. And the first one I, I want to you know talk about is these small iterations. And there's sort of different ways of doing this and a really common sort of model that takes small iterations and a few of the other things I've been talking about is called Scrum. And in Scrum, an iteration is called a sprint and it's a very time box period. And the, the job of everything else is to pick uh, a set of things that could be, you know, the next most important things that could be achieved in this week or one week or two week time time box period by the team and on, you know, and, and make sure that that's a sustainable amount of work. And then there's a bunch of other practices around that I'll talk to as we get to them that sort of fit into that. Um, but there's there's sort of other approaches and, and one you'll you'll sort of see uh, probably if you start to look into the literature is is sort of Kanban. And this actually comes from car manufacturing from Toyota, who who's um, pioneered uh, the concept of sort of lean manufacturing processes, which have a lot of commonalities with agile uh, software practices. And uh, sort of the idea with the Kanban board is uh, or the Kanban approach is to, to you know, you focus on limiting work in progress. And you don't let something go to the, you, the next stage until everything that's already at that stage sort of has flowed through. So if for some reason you've got someone in the team who who's sort of you know doing things that require work uh, for other people to do, you ensure that um, if they're making things faster than the next people can can kind of do what they need to do, then they should stop doing what they're doing and start you know working on the bottleneck. Um, and uh, a sort of key key way to define this work is is user stories, and these are uh, a mechanism for having conversations and defining the work to be done. And they start out as um, you'll hear the term sort of placeholder for a conversation. In the olden days, there would be literal post-it notes. Nowadays, there'll be virtual uh, post-its on a project board, but they start out as one or two, three maybe bullets, and they're uh, just enough information to let you sort of go, should we consider this for the next small iteration? And if you should, then you go and have those conversations with the users, with the domain experts, with the people sort of who, you know, who know the importance and, and, and can say what's what's useful. And then you flesh out those stories again, just enough so that you know what to develop. And then later as you're in the, the you know, the development stage of the iteration, you you sort of do the work to, to, to find the solution for that. And a key sort of feature of Agile is to make this work visible. So everybody's working on a shared project board of some kind. It's, you know, in the olden days, or if you're all in person, that can be literal post-its on the wall. In the Turing, we mostly use uh, sort of the GitHub project, GitHub projects boards, and I'll talk about that a bit more um, in the tools. Uh, but we, uh, uh, there, you know, there are others uh, such as Trello and so on, but GitHub's really nice, and it's the one that we use as as sort of software folk at the Turing, because it's also the place where we can manage our code and ensure that it's developed um, in a in a sort of controlled and and sustainable way, and that it offers some great collaboration tools. But the, the key thing here is that everybody can see what the work is, everybody can see what we as a team have picked to do and committed to do in the next sprint, say, and anyone who's not doing work on that sprint, uh, your collaborators can easily look in, see what's been worked on, what's ready to be worked on next, um, and uh, and can, you know, join in that discussion about sort of what their stories for the next iteration should look like. Um, another sort of key feature uh, is, is this sort of pair and team working, and, and, and you know, whether that's in terms of defining the, the, the user stories or writing the code itself, uh, you know, more brains are better than than one, and I'll talk a, a little bit about sort of how we size and estimate user stories later on. But um, you know, pair programming is is a technique that people either love or hate. Um, I've I've had great success with it, both with programming, but also with other non programming activities such as writing a grant, uh, writing a paper, writing documentation, and um, when you do this, it it can you know the natural instinct is to feel that working as a pair is going to be half as fast as working individually. And there's, there's not actually been sort of many really solid studies on this, but the ones that are suggest it's a little bit slower. You, you do a little bit less than two people working independently could do um, if you add up their work. But what you do, you know, the huge benefit is that you, you have less of that that needs reworked because the solutions you get to are, are higher quality because you've got someone right next to you who you can sort of bounce ideas off and get to a better, a, a sort of better solution, and you don't have to wait for, you know, someone else when you're when you're a little bit stuck or you think that you need input from someone else. Um, 
another sort of key thing that let's so so a lot of what we're doing here with agile practices um, as well as kind of being small and letting us bank value as we go and helping us kind of bound certainty in the small so that we can handle it, handle uh, uncertainty more in the large, is is sort of allowing us to move fast. And the idea with testing is that as you write functionality, you'll also write some tests. There's a, a, an approach that uh, some people in the team like uh, called test-driven development, where you write the test first and it doesn't work because you don't have the code. Then you write the code and then the test goes green. Uh, and then you know both that the, you know, the test works because if the code's not working, you've seen it fail. Um, but either way, whether you do it before, during, or, or shortly after, having tests that validate the key features uh, and the functionality of your code means that when you go and change that code in the next iteration or an iteration three, six, 12 months down the road, you can do that safely and quickly because if you break something, the tests will tell you you broke something. And you know, there's this uh, sort of lovely saying that your most frequent collaborator is yourself from you know six months in the future or uh, and uh, or six months in the past, and, and they don't answer emails. So again, you know, sort of testing documentation. These are things that sort of allow you to sort of make changes quickly and safely in the future and support that fast, rapid iteration. And that means that we can deliver value frequently and often. And this is a, a you know leads to a, a kind of another feature which is often tightly coupled with automated testing, but isn't you know is 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 uh, is itself a slightly different concept, which is continuous integration. If you've got multiple people working on different things, then rather than let those different things kind of develop in parallel for a long time, you ensure that they're brought back together very frequently, sort of two hours to two days, sort of time scale. And you work out any kind of conflicts between those, and it means that uh, you, you're always a, you know, a short step away from having something that works, and you're always a short step away from being able to finish an iteration with working software that has delivered some, some, some incremental value. And for those of you who are you know, uh, familiar with sort of branches as a, as a kind of way of working collaboratively on code, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later for those of you who aren't, um, continuous integration says, short-lived branches, like I said, you know, two hours to two days. Um, and the, you know, some people go even further and there's this concept of trunk-based development where everybody does their changes on a single branch. Um, but we don't, we don't sort of generally do, do it that extreme uh, in, in, in Reg. Uh, and then beyond continuous integration, what that lets you do is, is, especially if you've added automated testing, is let you have high confidence that this code is doing what it says it's doing and that you can therefore sort of deploy it so that the version that people can use sort of is, is now sort of improved, is the next improved version. And until it's used or, or it can be sort of validated with those that, you know, the people who know the domain or, or will be the end users, you haven't really delivered that value. And so it's not enough just to have it sort of ready to go. It has to get there in front of the, the end user and um you know in the in the scrum model at the end of each sprint there's a kind of demo session for for, for, for end users and the, you know and the version and a version of the software will be made available to them whether you deploy it into production is a, is a separate decision and those two things don't have to be tightly coupled but a lot of the you know internet based software as a service we use uh you know gets deployed into production multiple times a day and then I talked about this sort of learning and reflection sort of stage and 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 wherever you build them in, there's this concept of retrospectives. And in, in Scrum, there's something that happens at the end of each cycle uh, where you sort of look back uh, on how you've been working, what's worked well, what hasn't, and you consciously try and make things change for the, for the next situation. And then I'm sort of starting to get into sort of tooling here, but in, in this sort of world, uh, you know, if you're working on, on a team that's going to be doing more than you know that's sort of three plus people that's going to be doing more than one thing at once and if you're especially if you're working um distributedly uh so version controls sort of critical for collaboration and, and i'll talk a little bit about that and about branching up this way of sort of safely working on different things and, and bringing those changes together but even if you're just working yourself version control lets you sort of bank some changes you you, you combine it with testing automated or not you know those are good and it lets you bank known good configurations with additional value as you go and if even if you were the only developer uh you would sort of you know you could work on small iterations on a single branch of the code but making these snapshots as you go knowing that each of those was good knowing um that you hadn't broken anything that you'd done before and that's again you know key you know combining this version control and and, and sort of testing so that you know what known good 
commits is what we call a, a kind of saved change uh, to the code, uh, allows you to kind of rapidly iterate and rapidly build on, on, on what's done before. Uh, and then something I'll talk about a bit more in the tooling, uh, while you know the original Agile manifesto and principles back in 2001 focused very strongly on synchronous communication and in-person collaboration, um, nowadays, uh, you know, so many, you know, and definitely at the Turing, you know, so much of our work is is remote. Uh, it might be some synchronous collaboration, and I'll talk a bit about that later, but also a lot of asynchronous collaboration. And in the wider open source community or where we're working sort of beyond the Turing, such as, you know, in projects like the Turing Way and others, uh, you know, we're, we've all got different sort of commitments on our day job and the idea of, you know, getting the whole team together every day to sort of work together or even big fractions of the team is, is really difficult. And you know, the open source community has developed a, a range of tooling and practices to have effective asynchronous collaboration that, that you know, with, with sort of a, only a, a sort of small overhead compared to working together asynchronously. Um, so the last thing I'm going to talk about is, is some of the tooling that's available to help us sort of implement these practices. And as I do this, I'll talk a little bit about some choices that we've made generally at the Turing and particularly within the research engineering group. So the first thing uh, is sort of issues and and basically uh, I'll, I'll just pre preface this with a uh, 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 letting you know you know that here at the Turing and, and in Reg in particular uh, we leverage a, a tool called GitHub to do a, an awful lot of the you know help us support a lot of these practices and uh, it uh, what GitHub is is it's a it's a version control tool so it does that you know letting you save um, sort of snapshots of your code as you as you go along, but it's also a collaborative platform that lets you, you know, have asynchronous communication about what you're going to do and talk about these stories. It lets you sort of branch things off and then have conversations about sort of how that code's going, about the implementation. It supports connections with automated tooling and so on. And so I'll let you know as we as we hit each of these where we're talking about you know, for the Turing, a feature of GitHub, but there are other tools that support these. There's GitLab, which is uh, something that we also use in our safe haven, our trusted research environment for working safely with sensitive data, where that's got to be offline, so we need to self-host. But they're you know very similar, and and so what this is is this, uh, you know ultimately an issue here is a is an online story. It's it's a, like a post-it note, um, but it's sort of the post-it note with the ability to kind of add a. Uh, an arbitrary amount of detail from the conversation you're having, uh, you know, asynchronously online, so that others who aren't synchronously there to have the conversation um, can see it, and also yourself six months from now can go back and remind yourself why why we did what we did. Um, so these these serve that function of stories. It's it's a you know writing down uh, initially a few bullets. This is a thing we might want to do. This is why it's important to the user. And then as we figure out what stories we want to do, we start fleshing it out with some you know, validation of, okay, what is it we really want to do? How do we know if we've done the right thing? And then we might start talking about implementation choices, but usually if it's uncertain that we can implement it, um, you know, uh, often those implementation discussions will will be between the, you know, the people who pick the, the issue up and start developing it. And I'm going to highlight a few things here on the GitHub implementation of these. So you're seeing here a single text box, but this is actually a sort of single threaded series of, of kind of comments that you can sort of make and you can sort of edit these. And the idea is that you can actually have that sort of conversation, uh, you know, online asynchronously. You can assign people to it and people can subscribe to an issue so that they can be updated when, when someone's uh, made a comment. So it makes it easier to kind of have effective asynchronous collaboration. You can label things. Uh, so, you know, that might be an importance level. It might be a size. It might be um, you know, whether it's a feature or, 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 or a bug, you know, something that's not working. And there's uh, um, some additional things that you can you can sort of get nowadays that let you put numbers in for size and, and, and things like that. Um, you can attach it to a project, which I'll get to in a minute, but the project is like that board, you know, what are we doing? What have we chosen to do? What are we working on at the moment? You know, what's being done? And you can associate it with a milestone. And that's you know really helpful for saying, look, what are we going to do this sprint? And we can filter the board that way. And then finally, you can connect it to actual changes to the code. So you can see where that change that that you know delivered this story was uh you know what, what was made and go and take a look at it. Um now one of the things we need to do when figuring out how many things we can do in, in an iteration or deciding kind of what 
you know what's worth doing you know it's not just about the value but it's it's not just about the benefit but it's about the sort of cost benefit if something's kind of significantly more useful but costs a hundred times as much development time as something that's half as useful you know maybe the highest value thing is the thing that's half as useful so it's quite common to want to do some form of estimation but you know as i said in my sort of almost first slide even when you've got to the point where you know what the problem is and you know what the solution is you know there's uncertainty in the implementation and unless you are literally doing something you've done a hundred times before it's very very difficult to actually estimate things and there's a few tools that um, and, and, and approaches that we can use to try and get better estimates. And, and one of these is story points and, you know, there's a, uh, or uh, sometimes, you know, an alternative is T-shirt sizes. And the idea is that these are deliberately um, sort of rough estimates. So story points often go Fibonacci sequence or sort of doubling each time. So the smaller story might be a single point. Um, then, you know, the next, you know, if it's not a single point story, then it's a two point story. If it's bigger than a two-point story, then you say it's a four-point story. If it's bigger than a four-point story, you say it's an eight-point story. Or, you know, it's small, medium, large, XL, XXL, you know, sort of T-shirt size. And the idea with those is just, you know, you're not saying this is a day's worth of work. You're saying, or an hour's worth of work or a week's worth of work. You're saying this thing is meaningfully bigger than the next size down and meaningfully smaller than the next size up and over time you get a feel for you know how many points you might it might be reasonable to take on um and uh you know that sort of averages out over time and, and you sort of get better at estimating that um you can also take a wisdom of the crowds type approach there's this sort of planning poker model where each member of the team sort of puts their estimate in and then you you, you sort of have a process for for combining those into a team's estimate um, but you can also, you know, there's another approach, which is just make everything one point. You just keep slicing stories, um, you know, still in, in things that deliver value to the end user, but you do it until the thing is so small that you know it's going to be a day's work or you know it's going to be a couple of days work. Um, and and I think that last thing is is part of what's led to a recent sort of trend of a sort of no estimates movement that says, look, estimation is is, is helpful in deciding if something's kind of you know valuable rather than just um something you know that uh uh you know that, that that people want in other words it's it's you know it can be delivered uh with a reasonable amount of effort but if you make everything small enough and your iterations are small then you know what are you you know what value are you getting you know really the job of estimate estimating is to decide you know how many stories and which stories you're going to take on and commit to doing that that iteration that in that week or fortnight um, and as long as you can do that, you know, do you really need to put a number on it? Um, and this sort of takes me to sort of the project board, which in the physical world could often be post-its on a wall. And here I'm going to, this is kind of the classic one we use for sort of scrum based, um, you know, uh, sprints uh, uh, in, in, in Reg, but you might have other, uh, other columns for different sorts of processes, um, especially uh, around say handling changes uh, or, or, or queries to production systems but you've got the backlog and the backlog there's no commitment to do anything here it's a kind of parking lot for ideas it's a set of things you might do um, and for these you just put just enough to say why you might think it why it might be important you know any sort of little idea of why it might be difficult but just these few bullets that are placeholder for a future conversation and then as you sort of come to thinking about well what do we do next sprint you know the one after the one we're doing or maybe the one after that you start to say okay well what is it that you know what's our next most important stuff and you know, can we you know either say look you can pick anything from this bucket or you know this is the set of candidate things that we'll pull into next next sprint or in a kanban model you know pull off the top of this list or um you know pick anything in this list and these are the things that you will do these are the things that you're basically committing to doing um and then in each iteration you commit to doing you know a certain number of things and you pick a, a you know a set, a set of things that in their sort of size or complexity together you're confident you can achieve and that's the set of things that you're on the hook for for that week or that fortnight and the idea is you you get so you know you you, you reduce the uncertainty for each of the, these things so much that you regularly and reliably deliver the things that you said you'd deliver and you're doing that every fortnight and therefore everybody's confident that you know, um, every fortnight we're getting useful increments of value. And then finally, there's done. Uh, you know, once it's it's there, once it's tested, once it's integrated, and 
once it's got in front of users and you've at least learned from it, once it's, let's say, deployed, you know, um, whether it's, again, whether it's sort of released into production um, depends on what you're doing, whether you push it up to sort of, you know, one of the package repositories so that external people can look at it. Again, you know, that 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 will vary from project to project. But if it hasn't been seen by the people who will you know, benefit from that value or or know sort of the domain or know the, you know, the users, then you're not sort of learning whether that is delivering what you think it's delivering. And that's a critical part of the definition of them. Uh, and then finally, uh, on GitHub, you can filter these cards. And one of the things you can filter by is milestone so that you can say, show me only the things we're doing this sprint, uh, this iteration. And you can also filter by the labels or things that are, you know, uh, allocated to you. And these are just sort of ways of getting the most useful view of the board for any person at any time. Um, and a, a key feature for software, um, although you, you sort of need versions of this for other, other things like reports and, and, and sort of pros is, and documentation, is version control and branching. And, and I'm going to talk you through this sort of process. Uh, there's various types of sort of models for how you you know, use version control to collaboratively work on multiple things at a time. And this one here is, is called GitHub Flow. And you have a single main branch, and that main branch is always good. It's always got, you know, passed its tests, and it's always um, sort of ready to be used by somebody. It's, it's the, you know, it is the latest best version of, uh, you know, uh, of, of, of the software. Uh, and uh, what you do is you, for each of the things you've committed to do and each of the things you're going to do in parallel, which again should be fewer than the number of people you have in the team, uh, you create a branch and these branches should be short-lived, you know, hours to, to days. And then in that branch, you you sort of make changes, you test those changes, and then you, you know, commit those changes locally so that you you sort of, you know, do a little bit of work at a time and you, and you sort of benefit from almost a mini version of that iteration thing yourself. Each of these commits is a step towards that piece of end user value. And then when you think you're ready uh, and when you think you've sort of delivered on, on the piece of functionality that the story talks about, you create a pull request, which is uh, an ask for your changes to, to sort of merge back into this main branch. Um, and in the meantime, there might be some changes from others. So there might be some conflicts to resolve. Um, but as part of that pull request, and I'll come to this in a in a, in a, in a bit, um, there's a something a bit like an issue that allows people to look at your code changes and give you feedback on those. Um, uh, and uh, you can also attach automated testing in as part of that continuous integration process. And, and that's what this merging into the main branches. This is what we mean by integration. And uh, you know, altogether, that sort of is is sort of the quality assurance. It's the second brain. It's the you know the value of, of of ensuring that everything's passing its tests before it goes in, which means when you merge it, you know that it's good and you know that it's delivered the value that you you know you intended it to. And in the meantime, there might be changes from others. A lot of the time, they're in different parts of the code base, and the merge is just magic. Um, at other times, you might be working on very you know overlapping pieces of code. And you'll need to sort out kind of, you know, what the combination of those looks like. And you'll need a human brain in there. Um, and it might be that some of the feedback means you need to go back and make some more changes. And you go around that cycle, make test commit and, and update your pull request. Um, and another thing to sort of note here is, is this is sort of the asynchronous version. But if you've a pair of you have worked together on the code, then you've already got that feedback. You've already been sort of working together. Um, and you could create the pull request and, you know, you could decide as a team that you don't need any additional feedback because you've already had more than one brain looking at it. And then you just run the automated test. You just resolve any conflicts and, and, and sort of you merge it. And, you know, each of these sort of merge points, each of these dots changes from others represents, you know, a single story that has been finished to completion, pass all its tests, verified by someone else to, to have delivered what it needs to. And, each of those dots, when you add them all up together, you know, is the value delivered from one, one iteration. And at each point, this main branch is the best working version of the software. Again, you know, working software as, as the, as the uh, sort of measure of success and ensuring that we're delivering small incremental changes, even within a sprint. And then if, uh, you know, deployment means something different to sort of integration. So you, you know, are you pushing up to a package repository? Are you making it available, you know, on a website? Are you, 
uh, you know, making a release maybe on GitHub? Are you um, sort of updating some software that runs, you know, a, like a web application? Then again, you should be, you know, doing that fairly regularly. And at least once per iteration, you should be getting that little set of changes validated in front of the user or your domain experts. So um, just coming, you know, looking at this sort of pull request sort of bit at the end of the the, the sort of feature branch cycle. Um, this is sort of what, what it looks like in, in GitHub. And there's two sort of main things it does. Um, it allows you to do this asynchronous code review. So you can look at what's changed. The, so the red things here are lines that have disappeared and the, the green things are lines that have been added. Um, in the conversation, uh, which is a, a, a tab I, I think I, I'm, I'm not showing uh, in, in this presentation, uh, you can have, uh, you know, any comments you make uh, on, on on these lines, you know, these changes will be will be dropped into that conversation. Uh, and you might be having conversations about the best way to to kind of implement this change. Uh, and as with all of these things, the earlier you sort of get that input, the, the better. Uh, if you can, so if you, often there's, we'll choose to run a model where we open a pull request right at the beginning before we've written any code. We write sort of what it is, you know, how we think we're going to implement the solution and and then you know we invite comments from the team, and then you know when we do implement it, it's just uh, you know a case of checking that we've done what we said we've did. And the key thing with this asynchronous review is it needs to kind of not get in the way of that fast cycle. It's got to be something that be, can be done within the day or the next day. And a key feature for this, where we sort of settled as a, as a kind of general rule of thumb in the team, is that a pull request should be usefully reviewable by anyone on the project and anyone in the team. Now, those people will have different sort of sets of skills, but if we think about each of these changes, each of these stories as, as sort of two, two things, you know, the story says, what is it we want to do, you know? And then the pull request, you know, the code changes and any associated conversation about implementation is how are we doing that thing? So if it's someone from the project, they should be able to look at the issue and go, oh yeah, that's what we said we'd do. And then if the person who's written the code talks them through the code and says, this is how we're doing that thing, that person can go, yes, yes, you're doing the thing right. Uh, I can validate that what you think you've implemented is how I would interpret what we said we'd do. And similarly, if you grab someone from you know, Reg uh, who knows the programming language, you can sort of say, look, here's the issue. This is what we said we'd do. And, um, and this is what I'm trying to achieve here. And then they can validate that the implementation actually does what it says it does. So, you know, code review isn't this big, heavy gateway. It's a way to sort of add quality into the process to make sure there's a couple of brains looking at things. And if you've been working together and pair coding or, or team coding, then, you know, this, this aspect isn't necessary. The, the other thing that pull requests on GitHub let you do is like hook in automated testing. And you should be running sort of test the tests as you do your changes um, in your sort of development branch anyway. And each time, you know, you should be committing kind of knowing good changes, but the automated testing is this sort of final guarantee check before you sort of merge it in that everything's fine. And, and, uh, there's two sort of ways we support this at the Turing. One is, uh, a, a link into, um, uh, a tool called Travis, uh, CI. So CI is continuous integration. And the other is, uh, you can use GitHub actions, which are built into GitHub to run sort of test code, uh, automatically when, uh, changes are made. And so the way we usually have this set up is every time you update a pull request, the automated checks run and it, and it lets you know, and it will block sort of merging into main, uh, until you've, uh, sort of cleared, cleared those errors. Um, and then the the last thing I'm going to talk about is the collaboration tools, and this this is especially important um, for for us now that we're you know, a, a sort of really hybrid supporting uh, organization. Um, and obviously, one of the ways you can collaborate really effectively is is in person, uh, and that, and that's still true. And it was such a emphasis in the original 2001 Agile Manifesto and principles. But nowadays, there are also loads of ways we can collaborate remotely, uh, either synchronously or asynchronously. So Zoom and Teams, they're great for uh, collaborating synchronously, uh, especially, you know, where you've got a subset of the team, you know, one, two, three people. Um, or if you're sort of, you know, having a more structured uh, sort of session to, uh, you know, size your stories, to decide and prioritize what you're going to put into the next iteration, or to sort of start looking a bit further ahead as to your roadmap, you know, or, or, or sort of working with users to understand sort of what they need. Uh, 
for actually making code changes, you can either be on Zoom or Teams and have one person sort of making the changes. And then when you switch who's coding, you can you can sort of push that into um, uh, GitHub and the other person can pull it down. Or increasingly nowadays, the, the editors we use to, to make those code changes, as well as doing nice things for us, like highlighting the syntax, you know, and, and telling us where we might have got things wrong, uh, they can let us do more sort of real-time collaboration with our peers. Um, can use Miro, which is a, a sort of whiteboard, um, and then think of this as sort of post-its on a virtual wall, um, especially good for planning. Um, but the project board, you know, for stories is, is also a sort of virtual wall and post-its for, for, for that kind of thing. If we're not producing code and we want to work synchronously together, then HackMD, which is a sort of lightweight uh, formatted text editor that, that kind of feels quite, quite like, a, you know, light code, uh, uses something called Markdown, which is also how you uh, format text in, in the GitHub user interface. Uh, we can use Word Online, um, which is okay, but sort of has, has some challenges when the documents are complicated and uh, lots of people are trying to edit close together, um, or Google Docs if it's not something that's you know sensitive to just the Turing. Um, for asynchronous work, we talked about GitHub issues and we talked about PRs, pull requests. There's also now GitHub discussions, which are a great way uh, to have those these wider community discussions or discussions about how we might do something or what the relative importance of the thing is. And the key difference between discussions and issues is that they're sort of multi-threaded. So think, you know, you for you know, each comment box can actually have its own set of replies and it's helpful for more complex conversations. And then when you know what it is you want to do, you turn that into a story, into an issue. That issues can go on the board, pull requests can go on the board. You know, issues describe what you want to do, pull requests describe how you did it, um, and discussions are a bit more freeform. Um, so if you want to learn more, um, then here are some sort of links. And one thing I just want to really highlight is that there's a, a Tools, Practice and Systems coffee chat next Thursday uh, that uh, Anne is going to be talking uh, exactly about this. Uh, so if you want to kind of get more involved in that conversation, I would highly encourage you to come along to that. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop sharing um, so that we can uh, so I can take some questions.